Welcome to Stories That Stick, Stick, a podcast series about the stories that shape us. If I was to leave school halfway through about getting to year 11, like I'd be a punk. I'd be all types of stuff. So for me, it was just not an option. Hey guys, it's Ade here, your host for Stories That Stick podcast. As many of you might know, and if you're brand new and you don't know, welcome. But Stories That Stick shares the career journeys of most of our guests via the stories that have made an impact on their life to become who it is that they are. And so in today's episode, it's no different. We are joined by Ade Akin, who is a digital marketer, but I actually know him as a fellow podcaster. He is the co-host of the brilliant podcast called Ads Vice. So please do sit back and enjoy it. Oh, Before we do let you go, if you do want to get in touch with us, please follow us on Black Ticulate across all social media platforms. Alternatively, do email contact at Black Ticulate. We are definitely open for guest submissions as well as if you want to advertise on the show. Now, without further ado, I bring to you Ade Akin. All right, bro. Well, first and foremost, welcome, welcome to Stories That Stick. Thank you very much. I know you have listened to a couple of episodes, which I'm glad, because the very first question is we speak about death. Mm-hmm. How do you feel about death? Um, death is the one guaranteed thing in life, but it's the one thing you probably shy away from the most until you kind of have to. And two years ago, going on three years, I had to encounter that because my closest person in my life, period, my uncle passed away so yeah it's very very close to my heart I think about it if not weekly it could be even daily like I think about death a lot and does that inform how you live 100% it's the cliche stuff like I'm a lot more present in the moment I just try to appreciate things I really try not to hold grudges so it's definitely informed but I don't think I appreciate as much as I could but I appreciate a lot more than I did prior to experiencing death Right. So, yeah. So, and I don't like putting this out there because I don't want to tempt fate or anything, but what would you want people to know about you at this current junction, if you were unfortunately to pass? Um, I guess that I genuinely wanted to add value in everything that I did. If what I do is, is meaningless or anything that I've done, then I wouldn't be happy. Okay. Well, we will then get into the chapters of your life to see whether or not Mm -hmm. you are making a meaningful impact, which I believe you are, hence you on this platform. (laughs) So let's get into your first chapter, which is zero to 10. You need to paint some pictures for us. What was growing up like? Yeah. I'm first generation Nigerian born and raised in South London, but from about eight months to about year one, I was with an, a white family in Kent. Right. So I have the kind of childhood that a lot of black people can't relate to in the sense of like, I've, I've been strawberry picking and like, I had a really colorful childhood. Well, you know, it's a typical thing, unfortunately, it's known as farming. Did you know that? Yeah, I was going to say farming. Yeah. I, I've, I've actually watched that film, Farming. Have you watched that as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, And did you ever ask your parents why they did it? I think I asked once. And from my understanding, my parents, because I'm the youngest of three, and my older siblings were in Nigeria. Mm. So I didn't even meet my siblings until like I was five, six, that that I can actually recall. Like they only moved over here when I was six. So both my parents were in the UK working full time. So I think if you don't have to do childcare, then you're able to work full time and make more money. So I think it was all about money, basically. Now I hear you. So you didn't know your siblings until the age of six because they were nine. Yeah. So I knew, I knew I had siblings, but I had no relationship with them. Like, because obviously I was a baby when I've gone to Nigeria. And then I remember just being excited and like my sister was so warm to me still is to this day, like so, so warm. But me and my brother, um, never had a good relationship. We never had a relationship. Firstly, we have a nine year age gap and we've also come from two different worlds. He's come from the, I'm the older, so you should have a certain level of fear and respect. And also he was raised by my, by my mom's mom. So like, he doesn't even have the same relationship that I have, even though I have a weird relationship because I also have a white mom. So it's like me and him just didn't have much of a relationship. 
yeah, man, it was a very, very weird thing growing up. What I am picking up is you saying that you had a white mum. Now, let's speak more on that. You knew you were black, I'm assuming, or did you at this decade? Of course, but when you're a kid, yeah, you don't really think about stuff like that. But um, I remember a conversation that I had with my foster mum, my nanny at the time. Like, there was a young kid who was fascinated by me, always used to play with me. And I remember, like, I remember one day she told me, she was like, oh, you know, they love playing with you and being around with you because you're different. And I'm like, in what sense? And they're like, oh, because, you know, your skin's different. And I, and I think she used the word like, oh, you've got chocolate skin. And I remember being told like they're just jealous or don't mind them. So I didn't really know about race. And luckily, I came back to South London at a young age. So I went from no black people to everyone in the block is pretty much, <laughs> is pretty much <laughs> black. You know what I mean? So I, 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 I had a very, I never really had to think about that until I got older. So the race conversations weren't necessarily had in this decade? Never. Interesting. Never. For those who don't know, who aren't regular listeners to Stories That Stick, but what I tend to do with all my guests is I normally just give them a very brief questionnaire that asks them what was the fondest story they were told or read as a child, a teenager and an adult. And Ade, do you remember what you wrote for the child? I, I didn't follow your instructions. I gave you like seven different examples. Yeah. <laughs> and there's no wrong answer, evidently, because they all still had an impact in your life. But you mentioned Toy Story. So I was spoiled to the point where when I finally moved back to London, like South London, like I had, you know, the Ghana must go bags, the laundry bags. I had like several of those full of toys, games and movies. Like I had a lot of stuff. For anyone who's ever wondered what toys do when people aren't around. I remember being fascinated of the idea that when I'm not around, my toys definitely had their own life. They would move around like, like that happened. So when Toy Story came out, I was like, come on, this is proof. So I was just infatuated with that film and it's always going to have a, a special place in my heart. I, I never thought about what wasn't possible, basically. Did you ever share it? As in, like, how are you playing with others to bring them into your imagination and your world? Or was that something that you never really thought to do? I never really thought to do that, to be honest. I spent a lot of my childhood just being alone with my thoughts. And, like, I had friends, but leave me in a space with, like, my toys or my games, and I would just create my own fun. Okay. Well... The next chapter, I think, is where you really start forming your identity and who you are as a black man. Right? Sure. Life is looking very different mm -hmm. for you. You know, you've moved from primary school into secondary school. Yeah. So now we're in 11 to 20, your second chapter, second decade. Ade, tell us. Um, secondary school. Yeah. What's going on? Man, it's funny because prior to me being on your podcast, like I listened to the episode with my friend Pedri and we went to the same secondary school and she played it down so well, like hats off to her, but I'm not going to do that. <laughs> my secondary school was an absolute madness to the point where we had a police officer stationed in the school and at certain times we had police on a horse. Like my school was an absolute madness. The way you painted that picture of your school, I, like it was gang warfare. You know, you know, no, it was dead ass. Where my school was, was it was in the middle of, of two rival gangs. That's why we had the police. Like it was, <laughs> we've, like, you name it. I've been chased with samurai swords. Like my school was madness. So how did you navigate <laughs> your school then? How were you protecting yourself? And Man, yeah, go on. So in the early years, I was definitely trying to fit in. I was definitely trying to like be, be one of the cool kids, like try and try and be part of that life. And my parents were trying as much as possible to shelter me from that. So like they wouldn't let me play out or when they did, like it was extremely regulated. They wouldn't let me go to shrubs, like when everyone was going to shrubs and stuff. I would say like, basically I was one of those classic underachiever, like they're smart, but they're trying to kind of dumb themselves down. Um, I, I definitely got in trouble at school and especially at parents even oh they would they would that's when they would snitch and <laughs> that's, when they, that's when it became long for me <laughs> oh man were you at any stage and maybe it wasn't even you specifically it could have been someone who saw your potential within a certain topic or activity that was like saying you know what Ada, if you really focused on x uh, 
you can really achieve why. Yes. Okay, talk to me. Mr. Hallworth, he probably won't even remember. There was definitely a time when I was really into poetry. Like I loved poems. I loved writing. I was very, very like into that creative writing. And I remember there was teachers that would encourage me to kind of pursue that and to focus on that and really made me feel kind of like there was something in it for me. But I also remember I read a poem, a poem that I wrote, an original poem, and it was about a girl, a love-based poem. And I remember getting teased. This was way before Drake made being emotional and stuff. Yeah, yeah, before emotional black men were allowed to exist. But how, exactly. how old were you with this, with this poem? I was like 13, 14, because I was in year nine. Do you remember it? Yeah, yeah, I remember it vividly. Can I, you give us some bars? Oh, the, you mean a poem? I don't remember the poem at all, but it, was, it definitely would have been dope. I was dope. <laughs> <laughs> I was dope. Well, I, thought, I thought I was dope at the time, but that was the last time that I wrote poetry. After that, man, I kind of just, I got really, really just disheartened. I was like, oh, this is not for me. So this is where I'm at so far. You're in secondary school, one of probably the One most, of the worst schools in South London. One of the worst Facts. schools in South London, right. And in order for you to try and ensure you didn't find yourself in trouble, ironically, you got yourself in trouble to fit in. Yes, in a sense. I, I remember trying to be part of a crowd and then, long story short, things went sour and people turned against me. And that kind of gave me a, a wake up call because the people that I was trying to be cool with were serious people. And then when things went left, it wasn't fun. Um, I was in a situation where I remember like after school, because I know it's getting crazy. What I'm going to do is I'm going to stay back and do work. Let the madness die down and then I'll go home. Until right. one day, <laughs> until one day I'm doing that. And what's happened is the people who are from an area against the area that I live in are coming back towards where I'm walking out of. And then someone from my school basically says, that guy is from that area that all those other guys are from. And Next thing you know, I'm getting chased down by a bunch of people. I get fly kicked and I'm getting rushed. Like I'm literally getting rushed. And luckily, some heroic Jamaican man came out of nowhere and pulled me up off the ground and basically like covered me before the hammers and the knives came out. And yeah, after that rushing, I was like, yeah, this, is, this life is not for me. <laughs> so how do you go back to school the following day when that happens? Or what, even worse, show your face to your parents being battered and Yeah, bruised, yeah, my parents were proper scared. They were like talking about, oh, like sending me to Nigeria and all this stuff. And I was like, that's like the number one way to make me a target or to make me lose all credibility of ever being able to live a life in this country. Like that's not happening. And then it wasn't is even Is that like, what you thought or is that legitimately just how that is? Do you know? Both. Because you the idea... Okay, go on. No, what, what are you going to say? So if this was one of the catalysts for you changing, then yep. if leaving the environment isn't the best solution, how then do you yep. get well within the environment is fundamentally what I'm asking. Fair enough. How I was raised and where you come from, like you can't run away from your problems. You have to deal with it. Like if I was to have, um, if I was to leave school halfway through without getting to year 11, like I'd be a punk. I'd be all types of stuff. So for me, it was just not an option. But at the same time, I was also, that was a pivotal point in my life when I was like, okay, I am not personally involved. And I also don't want ramifications. Like, I wasn't saying, yeah, let's go back and do this. Like in my heart, all I knew is as long as I accept it, because I wasn't the target. So I was never one of those people. I just happened to know them and be associated with them. But that was for me was a wake up in the sense that I'm not cut out for that life. So I'm going to leave that then and just try as best as possible to mind my business. So now your mind and your business, what are you thinking? Are you starting to think career-wise, what's next? So around that time, I started looking into like, okay, so what could I do? And that's when the ideas of, okay, I want to study business in college. And when the opportunity came to apply for colleges now, I made a point to go to a college as far as way, <laughs> far away from my area as possible for the obvious reasons. So that was my way of removing myself from that environment to give myself the best opportunity to kind of make something. Yeah. And your thought process was still business and potential comms like writing. I was thinking more marketing and advertising as the route that I wanted to go down. So I'd done business, media, sociology and theology. 
again in your submissions within this decade, you mentioned advice that you were given about money from your uncle that made an impact. Yes. Do you want to expand on that and let us know what was the situation? Yeah, yeah. What happened? So I've just started college in, in West London. I've also just got my first ever retail job. I was working in JD Sports. And I remember around the same time, my parents actually, they moved to Nigeria. So it's a 17 year old boy who was getting paid weekly. And I worked in a trainer store. So what was happening is every week I was shopping. Like I was just getting paid buying trainers, getting paid buying clothes, getting paid. And then I remember my uncle coming to my house and just saying, you know, your parents are moving to Nigeria. You are going to be here by yourself. And if you continue like this, you're going to have no money. You can't fall back to your parents because your parents won't be around. He made me fix up and pattern up and just really take account of my finances. From that point on, like the little money I had, I was thinking about, okay, cool. I need to save money for a deposit so that one day I can buy a flat. And did you? Yes. Let's definitely get into your third and final chapter, how I actually know you in truth, which is within a podcasting mm -hmm. scene. Twenty plus, where we Ooh. see at the tail end of, you know, uni, you've graduated. So what's your first professional job? Yeah. University was in itself was that was like one of the best times of my life. Okay. What uni did you go to? I went to Aston, Aston in Birmingham. Studying studying marketing but me graduating with a first was never on the cards like I never thought it because my first year of uni retakes I had to do retakes in the summer the second year I had to do retakes in the summer so when I found out that I had graduated with a first like I was over the moon and it was such a beautiful feeling especially like looking back in terms of like how different my life could have been so to be in that situation I remember feeling good and also um I had just before I graduated, I'd made a decision that I was going to miss an exam because I had an assessment center with a potential graduate job. This was working for Diageo, who are the world's largest spirits company in the world. Long story short, I had secured that and I graduated with first. So I was on top of the moon, like life is set. And the job I got was a field sales job. So if you're familiar, it's, you're basically driving up and down in a car trying to sell. After the year elapsed, I came back to the head office and I was in that role for a few years. But within that time, I realized like how much I didn't feel like I belong there. I had a really bad director who at one point told me that, um, what value do you bring? Like, what, what are you doing? Like, I don't see what you're doing. And mind you, I've told you already, like a big thing for me is creating value. So to be told by my boss's boss's boss that, I don't see what you do. Like, I don't see your, I don't see your value. Like, do you know how, as in like, <laughs> obviously each individual, you're a human being. And if you're going through a bad day, you're going through a bad day. And you know, some people don't know how to process that. But to say that to some young yeah. upstart. In your team. That's wild. It also was because there was another director who I had basically, re her, her team seemed amazing. I'd spoken to her about, I like what would be the opportunities like in the future for me to join and she told my director my director didn't like that and then that coupled with she was uh, uh, office politics she was, man she was and, <laughs> I, and, I, and i mean it in the sense of she was just a horrible person who you know them people that they've, they've given their lives to a company so it's like anyone who has a life like what's wrong with you why are you not working on sunday to do what needs to be done but anyway yeah, yeah. so I'm, I'm disheartened. So in that time, I'm, I need an outlet because I'm not getting that kind of sense of creating value. I'm not getting that sense of purpose. I'm not getting that sense of people appreciate what I'm doing or appreciate me. So I've, I've started to put more effort into, into Advice. So Advice, which was a blog, which turned into, a, was my private blog, which turned into a communal blog, has now become a podcast. And I was, I was doing the podcast. I was doing blogs, I was doing events. I was really, as much as I believed in advice being bigger than what it was, it was also down to the fact that I needed something to prove myself. Like I needed, like my day job was going to shit basically. Mm. Like I needed to make something. So I was, I was desperately trying to take something that I had started as a passion and make it into a viable business. So 
I was just basically putting all my eggs into that basket and, and hoping for the best. And I hear you. So that's how you then started down the journey of advice. Yes. I'm giving you a whistle stop tour, but in 2015, whenever you would have come into contact with me, I was probably talking about all types of stuff. Like it wasn't really focused. We were just like giving advice or tips based on many different areas. And then being in marketing, I tried to really refine and focus on the why and why we were doing it. And where we've landed to is we are two friends who happen to be male and female. She's Black British Caribbean. I'm Black British African. We're both millennials. And we just kind of talk about different topics that we don't think get discussed enough with, through our own kind of personal lens. And that's what the Ads Vice podcast is in a nutshell. And that's what we, we do. Now I hear that. And that's why representation fundamentally matters, right? 100%. Let's talk about your final submission to the brief questionnaire. Yes. And you submitted The Tanning of America by Steve Stout. Tanning of America by Steve Stout. I don't know about this book at all. So what is it about? You know, give us an overview and then why it made or has made an impact in your life as an adult. Yeah, for sure. So those who don't know Steve Stout, he's a very influential black businessman who's been monumental in bridging the gap between brands and businesses and hip-hop culture. So he had a role to play in getting, I think, Pusha T and Justin Timberlake with McDonald's I'm Loving It campaign. And The Tanning of America basically was the first book that I'd ever come across that spoke about how hip-hop culture has shaped popular culture and how hip-hop culture and black culture has shaped business. And I feel like That was one of the first books that I read, which kind of really pinpoint how brands communicate and connect with audiences. And being someone that likes hip hop and marketing, it was like, yeah, a match made in heaven. But is that empowered you or emboldened you to want to create something like that? I mean, I don't know. I'm I'm just putting words in your mouth and that's not fair. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. Where my kind of career has kind of moved to is very different to where I thought it would move to. But all that I know, and I'm still kind of holding my heart on this, is that whatever I do, I want to create value. And I also particularly want to create value for the people that look like me. So I don't know what I'm going to be doing, but hopefully still creating value. I hear that. I hear that. I think that's rang true throughout your entire chapters about you wanting to create value. The last question I normally leave with is, if there's one book you can gift that you haven't already mentioned, but you can gift to loved ones, what book would it be and why? I'm not the biggest, I'm not the biggest reader. <laughs> so that doesn't, it's not, it doesn't help. Okay. Um, you know what? Let's, let me switch it up for you then. Rather than having that as a last yeah. question, you were a poet. You liked written words. Mm-hmm. Blank piece of paper, first page. Yeah. You write into your younger self. What's the first sentence? Um, just be true to yourself because it's a lot less work than trying to please others or be someone else. Just continue to be you. I hear that. Okay. Ade, it's been an absolute pleasure. It really has. So how can we find you on the World Wide Web? And when we do, what would you like us to do? Yeah, so on across all socials, it's I'm Ade Akin. So I am A D E A K I N S. But what's a lot more interesting than me are my two side hustles. So you've got Advice, the platform at Advice, A D Z V I C E, and Advice.com. And also my cocktails page. So if you like cocktails and want to improve your drinking skills in terms of making better drinks at home, AA cocktails with an underscore at the end. But yeah, I'm Ade Atkins. Once you're there, you'll find all of my babies on that page. So yeah, check me out. No, amazing. And guys, again, please do follow us as well. And do let us know what you think about this episode because we are trying to be better, better, better. See you in another episode. Bye. If you enjoyed today's episode, please do share it. And if you'd like to be featured on the podcast, please do get in touch.